My Family and Other Animals by Gerald Dorrell. Dramatized for radio by Janice Chambers. Looking through the eclectic memorabilia, which still survives from my <laughs> enthusiastic boyhood, I see that the whole chaotic adventure of it began in 1935. My family had just bought a house overlooking the sea in Bournemouth in order to make the most of the glorious summer that had been heralded by an early July heat wave. Inevitably, of course, July was then blown out like a candle by a biting wind that ushered in a leaden August sky, and a month of rain fell. Sharp, stinging drizzle that blew into opaque grey sheets all along the seafront and obliterated the view from our windows. It was the sort of weather calculated to try anyone's endurance. <gasps> Why do we stand this bloody climate? Not that my family ever had much. Language, dear? Least of all, my eldest brother, Larry. Well, look at it! And if it comes to that, look at us. I was only, what, 12 at the time, but already a keen observer of my family. So, how did my youthful self think we looked on that miserable August afternoon? I suppose, considered as a group, we don't look very prepossessing. The weather's brought with it all the things to which we're prone. My sister Margot's suffering from a fresh outbreak of acne. I mean, look at her. Face like a plate of scarlet porridge. Don't be so horrid, Larry. My brother Leslie's ears are all inflamed. I bleed all the time. Look at Leslie. Fourteen fathoms of cotton wool in each ear. I've got Qatar. Pouring into my skull like cement, so that I have to breathe through my mouth. Jerry sounds like he's had a cliff palate from birth. Our mother's got rheumatism and a cold. And as for you, mother, you're looking more oh. decrepit and haggard than every day. Indeed I am not. You are. Oh. It's probably just as well you're hiding behind that cookery book. Easy recipes from Raj Patana. You're beginning to look like an Irish washerwoman and your family like a series of illustrations from a medical encyclopaedia. The only one untouched by disease, of course is Larry. Irritated by our failings, he buzzes around like a daggery wasp. Be careful, Larry, you're treading on my shells. But, Jerry, if you will insist on labelling them all over the floor... Oh, you've just trotted up our razor shell. What we need is sunshine. Don't you agree, Les? Les? Leslie! Leslie unravels a large quantity of cotton wool from one ear. What do you say? There you are. It's become a major operation to hold a conversation with him. Honestly, one brother can't hear what you say and the other can't be understood. Really, it's time something was done. I mean, I cannot be expected to produce deathless prose. Larry's a writer. I said, I cannot be expected to produce deathless prose in an atmosphere of gloom and eucalyptus, can I? Yes, dear. Pardon? No, dear. What we all need is... Sunshine. A country where we can grow. <laughs> yes, that would be nice. I had a letter from my friend George this morning. He says Corfu's wonderful. Why don't we pack up and go to Corfu? All right, dear. Pardon? Where have you like, dear? You mean we can go? <coughs> when? When can we go? Well, I think it would be a sensible idea if you were to go on ahead, dear, and arrange things. And then you can write and tell me if it's nice and we could all follow. Very <sighs> clever, Mother. But no. You said that when I suggested going to Spain, and I sat for two interminable months in Seville, waiting for you to come out, while you did nothing except write me massive letters about drains and drinking water, as if I was the town clerk or something. No, if we're going to Greece, we go together. No, oh, you do exaggerate, Larry. Anyway, I can't just go like that. I'd have to arrange something about the house. 
A bridge? What, for heaven's sake? Sell it. I can't do that, dear. Why not? I've only just bought it. But then you'll be able to sell it before we've had a chance to tarnish anything. Don't be ridiculous, dear. I can't do that. It would be madness. <gasps> sell it? No, it's quite out of the question. Mother sells the house without too much trouble. Larry organises our passage to Corfu. And now, in September, we're due to embark. We're travelling light, taking with us only what we consider to be the bare essentials of life. Anything to declare? Margot's got quantities of cases, all filled with clothes, three books on slimming and a regiment of small bottles. Be careful with that one, it's fragile. Each one containing an elixir guaranteed to cure acne. Leslie's got one case containing a pair of trousers and two roll-top pullovers wrapped around... Guns, sir. Two revolvers, an air pistol, a book called Be Your Own Gunsmith and a large bottle of oil. It's leaking, sir. Larry has two huge trunks of books and a briefcase containing his clothes. Mother's luggage is equally divided between clothes and books about cooking and gardening. I'm the only one who's catered sensibly both for the long, tedious journey and the potentially thrilling flora and fauna awaiting discovery in this unknown island. Four books on natural history, a butterfly net, a dog... A dog? Yes, Roger. And a jar full of... What are those? Caterpillars. Well, they'll be chrysalids soon. So it's goodbye to the clammy shores of England, France and Switzerland. And their tiny ship throbs away from the heel of Italy and out into the twilight sea. Somewhere in the night, we pass the invisible dividing line and enter the bright looking glass world of Greece. At dawn, the sky is pale and stained with yellow. Ahead lies a chocolate brown smudge of land, huddled in mist. Then, suddenly, the sun shifts. The sky turns a smooth enameled blue of a... of a jay's eye. The sea flames turns to purple and green. Mountains, silver and green of olive groves. Fingers of black cypress. Curved beaches as white as tusks, rust-red cliffs, cities of gold, red and white rocks, and, ringing from the shore, a chorus of tiny voices, the shrill, triumphant cries of the cicadas. Well, now what are we waiting for? Mother. As if customs didn't take long enough. We've got a hotel to get to. And these horses won't stand here forever. Well, I hope they don't bolt. All of my clothes are in the cab behind us. Margot, all of everybody's clothes are in the cab behind us. Unfortunately, not everybody is yet in the cab in front. It's Roger. He's found a lamppost. He's taken Mother with him. Dear God. Come on, Mother, come on. It's no good just staring into space as if the dog wasn't relieving itself right next to you. Get it over here. We're all in the cab. Can't it wait? She's not, you know. The dog's been a damn nuisance all the way. Oh, don't be so impatient, Larry. The dog can't help it. Anyway, we had to wait an hour in Naples for you. My stomach was out of order. Well, presumably Roger's stomach's out of order. It's six of one and a dozen of the other. You mean half a dozen of the other. Well, whatever I mean, it's the same thing. Here we are. Oh. Come on, Roger. Oh, oh, he doesn't want to get in. Get him in. Oh, he's frightened. Oh, he's, oh, he's never seen a cab like this oh, before. Oh, oh, grab hold of him, everyone. Oh, 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 grab oh, hold of him. Oh, 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 Presumably the horse had never seen a dog like Roger before either. Is the cab of the luggage following? Um, 
What an entry into Corfu town. I had hoped to give an impression of gracious majesty, and instead we arrive in town like a troop of medieval tumblers. Even the stray dogs seem to be staring at us. Don't be dramatic, Mother. Well, they are. <laughs> oh. See, they're following us. We'll sit back and strain the raving Roger. Oh, don't just sit there, all of you. Chew them away. Get down, get down, you hungry little No, not by flapping at them like that. You're only getting them more excited. Oh, Lord. There's more of them. Mom, don't gesture like that with your magazine. It's not really nice. Where are they all coming from? Why doesn't somebody do something? It's like a scene from Uncle Tom's cabin. Why don't you do something instead of just sitting there criticising? All right. Driver, give me your whip. Me? <laughs> Take that, you mangy hound. <laughs> Oh, missed. What the hell do you think you're playing at? Accident. I'm out of practice. Long time since I used a horse whip. Well, watch what you're bloody well doing. Oh, it was an accident. I'll just have another go. My ah. hand! You're more trouble than the dogs, Larry. Do be oh. careful, dear. You might hurt someone. I should put the whip down. Yeah. Well, we're here now. Oh, thank goodness. Oh. 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 Yes, but how are we going to get out? There's a solid wedge of dog here. Oh. Uh, all right. well, I suppose they all think a canine riding in a cab's a bit effeminate. Well, nothing for it. I'll just have to cleave my way across the pavement. You, Mother, and the rest of you, will, you'll have to carry him through our way. Hurry up. Um, Madame? Ah, our name's Darrell. I believe you've got some rooms booked for us. There are rooms, four rooms and a balcony. And after unpacking, we descend to another room, full of contorted statuary, for lunch. Mm. Mm. Oh. Well, that was passable. What do you think of it here, Mother? Mm, the food's certainly all right, dear. Mm. They seem a helpful crowd. The manager himself shifted my bed near the window for me. He wasn't very helpful when I asked for paper. Paper, Leslie? What did you want paper for? For the lavatory. There wasn't any in there. Spat at the table. You obviously don't look. There's a little box full of it by the pan. Marco, dear. What's the matter? Didn't you see the little box? <laughs> <laughs> Owing to the rather eccentric nature of plumbing in Greece, the little boxes are provided for the um, debris, as it were. After you finished communing with nature. You mean that... Did you mean that was... Oh, my God! I might have caught some foul disease! <laughs> really is a disgusting way to do things. Quite apart from the mistakes one can make, I should think there's a danger of getting typhoid. Mistakes wouldn't happen if there was some proper paper in the first place. Yes, Leslie, but I don't think we should discuss it now. We go upstairs. Margot is in a state of semi-nudity. Splashing disinfectant over herself in quantities. I'm going to die! I know I am! Mother has to examine her at regular intervals. For symptoms of the fatal disease, she is sure she is hatching. Over the next few days, while sitting on our balcony, an apparently endless succession of funerals passes beneath us on their way to the local cemetery, which... Unfortunately for Mother and Margot's state of mind, happens to be just around the corner. I'm sure it's an epidemic. Nonsense, Mother. Don't fuss. But dear, so many of them. It's unnatural. There's nothing unnatural about dying. People do it all the time. Yes, but they don't die like flies unless there's something wrong. Perhaps they save them up to bury them all in a bunch. Don't be silly, Leslie. I'm sure it's something to do with the drains. It can't be healthy for people to have those kind of arrangements. I am. I'm going to die. Not necessarily, dear. Might be something that's not catching. I don't see how it can be an epidemic if it's not catching. Anyway, I think we ought to find out. Can't you ring up the health authorities, Larry? There probably aren't any health authorities here, Mother. There's nothing for it, then. We'll have to move. We'll have to find a house in the country with a bathroom. At once. Before we all go down with something. Me baño? A bathroom? The local guide whom we approach is not encouraging. What for you want a bathroom? Have you not got a sea? The next day, Mother herds us 
an irritable and argumentative group, down to the taxi rank in the main square to go house hunting. From all around us on every side, taxi drivers begin to scramble out of their cars and flock around us like vultures, shouting, each one louder than the other. Their voices grow louder and louder, their eyes flash. They begin to clutch at each other's arms and grind their teeth. They're grinding their teeth. And then they start to lay hold of us, as, as if they're going to tear us apart. Can't you do something, Larry? Tell them you'll report them to the British Consul. Don't be silly, dear. Just tell them we don't understand. We English, we no understand Greek. If that man pushes me again, I'll poke him in the eye. No, no, dear. I don't think they mean any harm. At that moment, an ancient dodge rolls up, and a voice rumbles out above the uproar. The sort of voice you would expect a volcano to have. Why? Them bastards were in use? Uh, no, not at all. He's lying, of course. It's just that we had some difficulty in understanding them. Use want someone who can talk your own language. Them bastards, if you shall excuse this the word, would swim to their own mothers. Excuse me a minute and I'll fix them. The man turns on the drivers a blast of Greek that almost sweeps them off their feet and herds them, gesticulating and angry, back to their cars. He's short and barrel-bodied, with hands like hams and a great leathery, scowling face, like a suntan gargoyle with a peaked cap. Now, where you want to go? Well, we're looking for a villa with a bathroom. A bathroom? You want bathrooms? Yes, we've been told it might be difficult. Oh, I know the villa with the bathrooms. I just wonder if it's uh, going to be big enough for all of you. Well, could you take us to see it, please? Oh, sure, I'll take you. Get into the cars. Thank you. <laughs> we shoot through twisted streets, swerve in and out and round loaded donkeys and carts groups of peasant women and innumerable dogs our driver chats the whole time English always wants bathrooms <laughs> <laughs> so I get a bathrooms in my house uh, Spyro's the name they call me Spyro Americano on account of I lives eight years in America <laughs> Yes, that's where I let my good English. <laughs> Every time he speaks, Spyro cranes his head round to check our reactions and the car swoops across the road like a drunken swallow. <laughs> I went there to make money. After eight years, I says, Spiro, I says, you've made enough. So as I come back to Greece, bring this car. <laughs> No one else got a car like this. <laughs> oh, all the English tourists know me. Uh, I like the English. Uh, best guys of peoples. <laughs> Honest to God, if I weren't Greek, I'd like to be English. <laughs> At last we come to the top of the hill. There you are. That's the villas with the bathroom like you wanted. Oh. Oh. Halfway up the slope, guarded by a group of tall, slim cypress trees, nestles a small strawberry pink villa, like some exotic fruit in the greenery. Bougainvillea sprawls over the front balcony as if hung for a carnival. In the garden, white cobbled paths wind round beds hardly bigger than a large straw hat, all overgrown with shaggy tangle of flowers, roses, flame red, Moon white, glossy and unwrinkled. Marigolds, like broods of shaggy suns. Pansies with velvety faces. Violets with heart shaped leaves. The air is thick with the scent of a thousand dying flowers and full of the murmur and whisper of insects. As soon as we see the villa, we know that we want to live there. We feel we have come home. 
having lumbered into our lives, now takes them over completely. Within a few hours, our taxi driver becomes our house mover, our guide, our champion and our friend. Don't you worry yourselves about anything, Mrs. Darrells. Leaves everything to me. <laughs> Soon we settle into the villa, each one of us in our own particular way. Margot takes up sunbathing in a microscopic swimsuit. Whenever her deck chair needs moving, or a bee flies too near, a band of handsome peasant youths appear like magic out of the deserted landscape. Margot, that costume doesn't cover an awful lot, does it? Oh, Mother, don't be so old-fashioned. After all, you only die once. <laughs> Larry uses three of these boys to get his trunks of books into the villa. The boys sweat and pant for half an hour. One of the trunks has to be hoisted into the window. Once they are installed, Larry spends a happy day unpacking them until the room is so full it is almost impossible to get in or out. On the second morning, Larry does get out in a very irritable frame of mind. I ask you, isn't it laughable that future generations should be deprived of my work because some horny-handed idiot has tied that stinking donkey near to my window? Yes, dear. Why didn't you move it if it disturbs you? My dear mother, I can't be expected to spend my time chasing donkeys about the olive groves. I threw a pamphlet on Christian science at it. What more do you expect me to do? The poor thing's tied up. You can't expect it to untie itself. Can't one of you go and move it? Why should we? It's not disturbing us. That's the trouble with this family. No give and take, no consideration for others. Well, you don't have much consideration for others. It's all your fault, you know, Mother. You shouldn't have brought us up to be so selfish. I like that. I never did anything of the sort. Well, we didn't get as selfish as this without some guidance. <laughs> This remark upsets Spyro. Call his master, Loris. Don't jokes like that. Spyro adores Mother. But he's quite right, Spyro. <laughs> Leslie joins in wickedly. She's not really much good as a mother, you know. <laughs> She's never done anything for us. Don't say that. Don't say that. Honest to God, if I had a mother like yours, I'd go down every morning and kisses her feet. In the end, Spyro and I unhitch the donkey and move it further down the hill. Look, I really cannot be expected to work like this. <sighs> now the villa's being rocked to its foundations every five minutes by Leslie, shooting at tin cans with a revolver out of his bedroom window. I have to practice. Practice? It sounds more like the Indian mutiny. Perhaps you could practice with an empty revolver, Leslie. That isn't possible, Mother. Well, it is a little fraying to the nerves. Very well, then. I'll move my tin can a little further away from the house. Nearer to the donkey, perhaps. Mother, spectacles askew, muttering to herself, drifts happily around either the kitchen, now filled with a selection of bubbling pots, or the garden, reluctantly pruning and cutting, enthusiastically weeding and planting. And as for me, every morning I simply cannot wait to get out and investigate the life that is teeming on our doorstep. Jerry, must you gulp and slush your breakfast like that? Eat it slowly, dear. There's no hurry. No hurry? With Roger waiting at the garden gate, an alert black shape watching for me with eager brown eyes. No hurry? with the first sleepy cicadas starting to fiddle experimentally among the olives. No hurry, with the island waiting to be discovered. There is time to tease Roger only for a moment. Oh, I think perhaps it isn't worth going out today. No, Roger, I really don't think we should. It looks like rain. So I might just as well sit in the garden with a book. Oh, all right then, Roger, come on. And then we are off. Off to the quiet, remote olive groves, to the blackbird-haunted myrtles, to the narrow valleys full of cypress trees, venturing ever further and further afield in our endless voyage of discovery. 
Mother, did you know that sea slugs can squirt water out just like a water pistol? I didn't, dear, no. They can do it out of both ends. I shouldn't discuss that part of it with strangers, dear. Larry, did you know that lace-winged flies laid their eggs on stilts? No, but I expect it's because they don't wish to be interrupted in the middle of creation. Leslie, did you know that a huntsman spider stalks its prey and never, ever misses? No. But then neither do I. Margot, I found an earwig's nest with babies in it. Sweet. One day, I meet the rose beetle man. I hear him before I see him. On a high, lonely road in the mountains. Because he plays his shepherd's pipe. He is short and thin, as though he doesn't have enough to eat. And he has a sharp face like a fox, and large slanting eyes, almost black, with a bloom on them, like a pearly covering, and a vacant look. His dress is fantastic. He wears a shapeless hat with a wide, floppy brim, once bottle green, but stained with wine and dust. And in the band, there is a forest of bird's feathers, Cock feathers, hoopoe feathers, owl feathers, the wing of a kingfisher, a swan feather, the claw of a hawk. His shirt is worn and frayed and grey with sweat, with an enormous cravat of vivid blue satin. He has a dark, shapeless coat with patches and leather shoes with upturned toes and black and white pom-poms on them. He carries mysterious sacks on his back bamboo cages full of pigeons and chickens and bunches of leeks and he holds his pipe in one hand and in the other a number of lengths of cotton each tied to an almond sized rose beetle glittering golden green in the sun all flying round his hat with desperate deep buzzings trying to escape from the thread tied round their waist the rose beetle man is dumb I buy from him a tortoise, who is intelligent and lovable, and who soon learns the name I give him. Achilles? So that he comes lumbering into view whenever he is called. Achilles! Achilles! And who loves to be fed? Strawberries are his passion. He's eaten my entire bed! But so is human company. Anyone going into the garden to read or sunbathe can be sure of Achilles' earnest, wrinkled little face poking through the sweet Williams as he comes to find them. Margot, sunbathing in the garden. I don't think she finds having the sharp claws of a determined tortoise embedded in her thigh very conducive to relaxation. I bet he was only trying to climb onto her stomach. He likes Margot. I also buy a very fat young pigeon. He looks rather revolting, with his feathers pushing through his wrinkled scarlet skin. And Larry suggests I call him... Quasimodo. Due to his unorthodox upbringing, Quasimodo soon becomes convinced he is not a bird at all refuses to fly, walks everywhere, and insists on sleeping in the house, preferably on the end of Margot's bed. <coughs> I bet he was only trying to say hello. He likes Margot. My mother calls a family council. What am I going to do about Jerry? He's running wild. He needs a proper tutor. Plenty of time for all that later. I mean, he can read, can't he? I can teach him to shoot, and if we bought a boat, I could teach him to sail. But, dear, that wouldn't really be much use to him later on, unless he were to go into the Merchant Navy. I think it's more essential that he learns to dance, or else he'll grow into one of these awful tongue-tied hobbledehoys. Yes, dear, but that can come later, too. He should be getting some grounding in things like mathematics and French, and his spelling's appalling. A good grounding in literature. That's what he needs. I've been encouraging him to read some good stuff. Yes, but don't you think Rabelais is a little too old for him? Good, clean fun. It's important he gets sex into its right perspective now. What he wants is a healthy outdoor life with lots of shooting and sailing. Oh, stop talking like a bishop. You'll be advocating cold bars next. The trouble with you is you get into one of these damned supercilious moods where you think you know best and you won't even listen to anyone else's point of view. With a point of view as limited as yours, you can hardly expect me to listen now, to Now, now, there's no sense in fighting. Well, Larry's so bloody unreasonable. I like that. I'm far and away the most reasonable member of the family. Yes, dear. Now, what we want is someone who can teach Jerry whilst encouraging him in his interests. He appears to have only one, and has this awful urge to fill things with animal life. I don't think he should be encouraged in that. 
I went to light a cigarette this morning and a damn great bumblebee flew out of the matchbox. When I tried, it was a grasshopper. And I found the most revolting jar of wriggling things on the dressing table of all places. He doesn't mean any harm, poor little chap. He's just so interested in all these things. I wouldn't mind being attacked by bumblebees if it was going to lead anywhere. But it's just a phase. He's been in this phase from the age of two and he's showing no signs of growing out of it. Well, if you insist on stuffing him full of useless information, I, I suppose George could have a shot at teaching him. George is the friend of Larry's who is responsible for us being here. All through the winter, George teaches me, quickly focusing my interest in natural history by getting me to note down my observations in a diary. He also soon gets a knack of how to interest me in less immediately popular subjects. If it took three men a week to build a wall, how long would it take 12 men to build... No, let's try it another way. If it took three caterpillars a week to eat one leaf, how long would it take 12 caterpillars to eat eight leaves? Two weeks. Very good. I begin to see the way forward. Our lessons continue apace after that. So Columbus set foot in America. And the first thing he saw when he landed there was a jaguar. Goodness, he said. I've never seen any animal like cross the Alps with his elephants. And the names of the elephants were Arthur, Esmeralda, and Matilda. so Nelson murmured his last words. Kiss me, Hardy. He'd already told Hardy that if anything happened to him, he could have his collection of bird's eggs. This is because they were close friends. And had in geography, George and I make giant maps and fill in all the places of interest with drawings of the most exciting fauna to be found there. And... And a word or two about their main products. So, Jerry... With what do you associate Ceylon? Tapirs. And tea. India? Tigers. And, uh, mm, Rice? Australia. Kangaroos. And? Sheep. And? Koala bears. Right. Can I start drawing them all now? Our oceans are soon full of whales, albatross, penguins and walrus. Our deserts positively lumpy with camel humps and our tropical forests so tangled with jaguars, snakes and gorillas that little natives have to hack wearily at painted clearings for the express purpose of writing Cereals In the more Coffee Spring comes to the island and my journeyings to and from my tutor's house begin curiously to take longer than the duration of the lessons in between. One day, returning from a lesson with George, I am lying on my stomach, examining a mossy bank in an olive grove, when I notice a few scattered, faint, circular marks in the moss, each one the size of a shilling. I prod the edge of one of the circles with a piece of grass, gently at first, then more vigorously, and suddenly... My stomach lurches with excitement. The whole circle lifts up. Like a trap door. It is a trap door. And it's lined with... Silk. There's a small flap of silk acting as a hinge. And a... A tiny, tiny tunnel underneath. What on earth's made this? I can't see any sort of creature nearby. So, bursting with suspense... I race back to George's to see if he can solve the mystery. But George has somebody with him. Jerry, from the joyful speed of your entry, I presume you've not come back for a little more Latin. My visitor, by the way, is Dr Theodore Stephanides, who is, like you, a nature lover. Uh, well, I'm not an expert, but very pleased to meet you, Jerry. How do you do? I describe the mystery to my exciting new acquaintance. Well, thank heavens you're here, Theodore. I can hand the problem over to expert hands. Yes. I think I know what has made these uh, burrows, but perhaps if they are not too far away? No, they're quite close. We could go and examine them together and verify whether my uh, suspicions are correct. Oh, yes, please. My new acquaintance and I walk in silence till we reach the gloomy olive grove and I point out the mysterious trap door. Ah, yes. Um, yes. Genzia. The handiwork of the trap door spider. The trap door spider? Yes. This particular burrow appears to be uh, uninhabited. 
Generally, you see, the creature would be holding on to the trapdoor with her legs until a fly or a grasshopper were to walk past. Then she would pop out of her hole to uh, catch it. They are female burrows, of course. When a male comes in search of the female, he must walk over the moss to the trapdoor. I have often uh, wondered why he is not uh, devoured by the female in mistake. <laughs> it is possible, of course, that his footsteps sound different. I say goodbye to this clearly great scientist. The next day I receive a parcel and a letter addressed to me. My dear Jerry, I wondered if it would assist your investigations into the local natural history to have this pocket microscope. Not of high magnification, but sufficient for field work. Sincerely. Theodore. Stephanidis. Spring affects the rest of my family in a variety of ways. Larry buys himself a guitar and a barrel of red wine and takes to singing Elizabethan love songs with many pauses for refreshment. This seems to make him very gloomy. Spring for me is not the beginning of the new year. But the death of the old one and the grave yawns a little wider with each season. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Yawns is good. One evening we go out and leave Mother alone with Larry. When we return, she's standing by the door with a hurricane lantern. Hello, everyone. Pleasant evening. Yes, lovely. Yes. Yes. Good. Well, I waited up because I just wanted to tell you that when I die, I'd like to be buried underneath the rose bushes. Those ones. Over there. Mother. Good night. <laughs> when left undisturbed by Larry, however, spring means for Mother an endless array of vegetables with which to experiment and an endless number of new dishes for us to try each one richer than the last. Larry begins to suffer from dyspepsia and procures an immense dinner by carbonate of soda, which he takes solemnly after every meal. Mm. Why do you eat so much if it upsets you, dear? Uh, it'd be an insult to your cooking, Mother, to eat less. You're getting terribly fat. Nonsense. I'm not getting fat, Mother, am I? Mm, you look as if you put on a little weight. Well, it's your fault, then, tempting me with all these delicacies. You're driving me to ulcers. I shall have to go on a diet. What's a good diet, Margot? <laughs> well, you could try the orange juice and salad one. That's awfully good. Then there's the milk and raw vegetable one. That's good, too, but it takes a little time. Or there's the boiled fish and brown bread one. I haven't tried that one yet myself. Dear God, are those diets? Yes. The orange juice one has done wonders for my acne. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it if it means I have to champ my way like a damned ungulate through bushels of raw fruit and vegetables. You'll all have to resign yourselves to the fact that I shall be taken away from you at an early age, suffering from fatty degeneration of the heart. Spring has a very bad effect upon Margot's interest in her personal appearance, turning it into an obsession. She spends hours in the bathroom, from which she is as hard to dislodge as a limpet from a rock, eventually emerging, glowing and immaculate, to go and swim in the sea or sunbathe in the olive groves. It is Spyro who breaks the news of what this has led to. Mrs. Darrells, mm -hmm. I am very sorry to have to tell you this, but I, I think you ought to know. What's the matter, Spyro? It's Miss Marco. What about her? Don't you know she's meeting a man? A man? Oh, uh, yes, I did know. She's lying, of course. But did you know he's a Turk? No, I didn't know he was a Turk. What's wrong with that? Of course, Mrs. Darrells. What's wrong with it? He's a Turk. I wouldn't trust the son of a bitch Turk with any girls. Really? He'll cut her throats. That's what he'll do. Honest to God, Mrs. Darrells. It's not safe, Miss Marcos, swimming with him. All right, Sparrow. 
I'll speak to Margot about it. So, Mother invites the Turk to tea. <laughs> the Turk turns out to be a tall young man of staggering conceit. He presses Mother's hand to his lips as if he were conferring an honour upon her. Mm. Enchanted. She, feeling the hackles of the family rise, throws herself into the breach. <laughs> Lovely having you. I've wanted so often to, but there never seems time, you know. The days simply fly past. Marcus told us so much about you. Do have a scone. So kind. He's on holiday here. Really? On holiday? Amazing. I had a holiday once. Remember it clearly. <laughs> One of you is a writer, I believe. Larry's eyes glitter. Mother throws herself into the breach again. Yes, yes, it's Larry. He writes away day after day, always tapping at the typewriter. Writing. I always feel I could write superbly if I tried. And again. Really? Well, yes, it's a gift, I suppose. <laughs> he swims well. He goes out terribly far. I have no fear. I'm a superb swimmer, so I have no fear. Ah. When I ride the horse, I have no fear, for I ride superbly. <laughs> I sail the boat magnificently in the typhoon without fear. <laughs> you see? <laughs> I am not a fearful man. Ah. Luckily, Margot takes a dislike to the perfume the Turk wears when visiting and drops him. What a shame. I enjoyed imagining you and Mother galloping about Constantinople on camels with your yashmaks rippling seductively in the breeze. For Leslie, the coming of spring is marked by the purchase of a double-barreled shotgun. Isn't she a beauty? Isn't she a honey? And a flight of turtle doves at dawn. Come on, Jerry. That's six. We've got enough. Let's give the poor devils a rest. <laughs> Just as we are starting to enjoy the island in our various ways, Larry writes to all of his friends and asks them to come out and visit. Oh, by the way, Mother, I've asked a few people to come over for a week or so. That's nice, dear. I thought it would do us good to have some intelligent company around. We don't want to stagnate. I hope they're not too highbrow, dear. Good Lord, Mother, of course they're not. They're just ordinary people. I don't know why you've got this phobia about my friends being highbrow. Well, I don't like the highbrow ones. I'm not highbrow, and I can't talk about poetry and things, but they always seem to imagine, just because I'm your mother, that I can, and come and ask me silly questions just when I'm in the middle of cooking. <laughs> anyway, you better let that hotel and Corfu know when they're coming. Whatever for? Well, so they can reserve the rooms. But I've invited them to stay here. Larry, you haven't. How can they possibly stay here? Where are they going to sleep? There's hardly enough room for us. Nonsense, Mother. There's plenty of room if the place is organised properly. If Margot and Leslie sleep on the veranda, that gives you two rooms. And if you and Jerry move into the drawing room, that gives you two rooms more. Don't be silly, dear. We can't all camp out all over the place like gypsies. And Margot and Leslie can't sleep outside. It's still chilly at night. No, there simply isn't room. You'll just have to write to these people and put them off. I can't put them off. They're already on their way. Really, Larry, you are the most annoying creature. Why didn't you tell me before? Well, I didn't know you were going to treat the arrival of a few friends as if it was a major catastrophe. How many have you invited, anyway? Only a few. Two or three. They won't all come at once, anyway. I expect they'll turn up in batches. Batches? Larry, how many? I can't remember. Some of them didn't reply. That doesn't mean anything. They're probably on their way and thought it was hardly worth letting us know. Anyway, if you budget for seven or eight people, I should think that would cover it. You mean including ourselves? No, as well as the family. Larry, we cannot possibly fit 13 people into this villa with all the goodwill in the world. Well, if the villa isn't big enough, we'll have to move to one that is. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Who ever heard of moving into a larger house just because some friends were coming to stay? It seems a perfectly sensible solution to me. And even if we did move, what will we do with the extra space when they're gone again? Invite some more people. Really, Larry, you do make me cross. Well, I've been as helpful as I can. I, I can't do any more. Larry, don't just pick up 
your book and read. Do something! But every suggestion I make, you disagree with. Clara, dear, be reasonable. We cannot rush off and buy a new villa just because some people are coming. I doubt whether we'd find one in time now anyway. And there's Jerry's lessons to think of. All that could be easily sorted out. No! I've made up my mind. We are not moving into another villa, and that is final! Our new villa, found for us by Spyro, is enormous. A tall, square Venetian mansion with daffodil yellow walls, standing on a hill overlooking the sea, surrounded by silent orchards. It has an atmosphere of gloom about it. It's filled with dangerously decrepit relics of Victorian furniture, continually shedding bits of themselves with loud cracks, like musket shots, and comes complete with an extremely lugubrious servant called Lugaretzia. <gasps> Lugaretzia is a hypochondriac. Bulletins on the state of her stomach start at seven in the morning when she moves from room to room with our tea trays, groaning, gasping, doubling up in agony and stamping about in her effort to convey her nightly battle with her inside. Can't you do something about that woman? What do you expect me to do? I've already given her some of your bicarbonate of soda. I'm sure she doesn't eat properly. She probably needs a good diet. Nothing short of a bayonet would do her stomach any good. I know. I am already distressingly familiar with every convolution of her large intestine. She is a bit trying, I know, but after all, the poor woman is obviously suffering. Nonsense. She's enjoying every minute of it, like Larry does when he's ill. Well, anyway, we'll just have to put up with her. There's no one else we can get locally. I'll ask the doctor to look over her next time he comes out. If everything she told me this morning is true, he'd better provide him with a pick and a miner's lamp. Larry, don't be disgusting. <laughs> Honestly, Mother, she's not a maid, she's a ghoul. Perhaps we could buy her a ball and chain. At least we'd know when she was coming and be able to escape. Now, dear, don't be unkind. But don't you think taking her shoes off during dinner last night to show us exactly which toes were hurting was a little excessive? <gasps> Though I suppose it did distract from the problem of the leg coming off the dining room table and the food going all over the floor. Anyway, I'm going to have all my meals in my room from now on. Oh! <laughs> Larry leans back in his chair, meaning to conclude the conversation, only to disappear as the entire back of it collapses in a cloud of dust. When, later, Mother opens a wardrobe the size of a cottage and finds that the entire door also comes away in her hand. She decides that something must be done. We simply can't have guests to stay in a house where everything comes to bits if you just look at it. We have to buy some new furniture. Really, these guests are going to be the most expensive we've ever had. The next day, Spyro drives Mother, Margot and myself to buy furniture. The town seems unusually crowded and, struggling to get back to the car afterwards, we are swept along in the opposite direction against our will. I think there must be something going on! Yes, dear! I've picked up some Greek, so ask an elderly peasant woman what is happening. St. Spiridion is the patron saint of the island, and it seems that today is the annual opportunity for the faithful to kiss the slippered feet of his mummified body, normally contained in a sarcophagus, and to make requests of him. Apparently, he can cure illness and do any number of wonderful things if he's in the right mood when asked. We are swept into the church, like pebbles in a lava flow, along with hundreds of elderly peasant women in their best black clothes, their husbands, hunched as olive trees, with fishermen, bronzed and muscular, with the sick, the mentally defective, the consumptive, the crippled, with old people hardly able to walk, and babies wrapped and bound like cocoons. Margot has been pushed well ahead of me. Mother, hopelessly entangled between two enormous Albanian shepherds, is far behind, grimacing and pointing at the coffin and shaking her head vigorously. The Albanians and I are greatly puzzled by this and wonder if Mother is going to have a fit. At last, she throws caution to the winds. Tell Margot not to kiss them. Tell her to kiss the air. Kiss 
The air! Her warning comes too late. Margot is already kissing the slippered feet with an enthusiasm that surprises and greatly enchants the crowd. When it comes to my turn, I obey Mother's instructions, kissing the air reverently, six inches above the mummy's left foot. Then I am pushed along and out into the street to join Margot. After a few moments, Mother too is shot from the door. Those shepherds! How did they manage to smell like that? Oh well, it'll have been worth it if St. Spiridion answers my request. Most insanitary procedure. I dread to think what we'd have caught if we'd really kissed his feet. But I did kiss his feet. Margo, you didn't. After all those people had been slobbering all over them. Well, I thought he might cure my acne. Acne? You'll be lucky if you don't go down to something a lot worse than acne. The next day, Margo falls ill, and St. Spiridion's prestige with Mother reaches rock bottom. The always overprotective Spyro is beside himself. We send for a doctor, and eventually, after some delay, Dr. Andrew Hurley arrives, a dumpy little man with patent leather hair and an extraordinary bedside manner towards Margot. Po, 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 po. Remarkably unintelligent you have been, no? Kissing the saint's feet? Po, 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 po. Nearly you might have caught some bugs unpleasant. Sorry. You are lucky. She is influenza. Now, you will do as I tell you, or I will rinse my hands of you. And please, do not increase my work again with such stupidity. Sorry. If you kiss another saint's feet in the future, I will not come to cure you. Oh, he, oh, he, oh, he. I will let you die. Po, 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 po. Such a thing to do. Spyro is not so easily crushed. Why are you coming so late anyways? Ah, yes, Spiro. Sorry, madam. It was my wife. She has just been delivered of a baby. Oh, congratulations, doctor. We must have a drink to them both. Here we are. <laughs> Yammers, isn't it? What? You get another baby? Yeah. Yes, Spiro. A boy. How many you get now? Ixi. Six. Only six. Why? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Six? Collies! Carrying on like cats and dogs. But I like children. When I get married, I ask my wife how many she wants. And she says, two. So I gives her tooth, and then I get her sewed up. Six children. Honest to God, you makes me want to throw cats and dogs. For Roger and myself, the best thing about the new villa is its 15 acres of new garden to explore. And with my tutor George finally leaving the island, the freedom with which to do so. There are many new bees to occupy me. Emerald green tree frogs, brilliant lizards, all sorts of snakes. Don't you ever, ever bring any snakes anywhere near me. And birds of all kinds. Goldfinches, greenfinches, red stars, wagtails, orioles and the occasional hoopoe. Under the eaves of the villa itself, swallows arrive to take up residence. Come on, Roger. Let's go and have a look. But it was around this time that Larry's friends also finally arrived to take up residence, an endless stream of them. My soul has been trapped. No sooner did we see one lot off, sighing with relief, than another steamer full would arrive, and the line of taxis and horse-drawn carriages would clatter up the drive and the house fill yet again. Oh. 
Sometimes a fresh lot of guests would turn up before we got rid of the previous lot. The chaos was indescribable. The house and garden were crammed with poets, authors, artists and playwrights, arguing, painting, drinking, typing and composing, and who were all so far from being the ordinary, charming people that Larry had promised, who were all such extraordinary eccentrics, that they were to make my family, yes, my family, seem quite commonplace. family and other animals, younger Jerry was played by Adam Usden and older Jerry by Will Tacey. Mother was played by Celia Imry, Larry by Toby Jones, Margot by Anna Kirk and Leslie by Paul Hunter. Spyro was played by Andreas Marcos, Lugarezia by Katia David and Dr. Andrew Celli and Theodore by Graham Hawley. All other parts were played by members of the cast. Original music was composed and performed by James Mackey. My Family and Other Animals was written by Gerald Durrell, dramatised for radio by Janice Chambers, and was directed in Manchester by Polly Thomas. Family and Other Animals by Gerald Darrell. Dramatised for radio by Janice Chambers. Of all the numerous invasions made by Larry's friends into our daffodil yellow villa in Corfu that summer, my favourite one consisted of three artists, Jonquil, Durant and Michael. John Quill looked and sounded to my young self... Like an owl with a fringe. Durant was lank and mournful and... Jumps out of his skin if I speak to him. And Michael looked... <laughs> <laughs> like, like a, a well-boiled well -boiled prawn. prawn. They had only one thing in common, and that was a desire to get some work done, as John Quill, striding into the house for the first time, made clear to my startled mother. Nah, I haven't come for no bleeding holiday. I've come to get some work done, so I'm not interested in picnics and such, you see. Oh, uh, no, no, of course Just so long as you know, I haven't come to upset nothing, see? I just want to get some work done. Saying this, John Quill promptly retired to the garden in a bathing costume. Where she remains for the rest of her stay. Uh, Mr Durant... Work is also all I want to do, but I'm not sure if I will be able to. I am shattered, you see, quite shattered by recent experience. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I was in Italy when it came upon me that I was going to paint a masterpiece. <gasps> How wonderful! I mean, wonderful! <laughs> I decided an orchard in full bloom would give me full scope to my brush. I drove about Italy for weeks, searching for the right orchard. You may imagine the difficulty I had. Uh, well... At last, I found the right orchard. The perfect one. The setting, magnificent. The blooms full and thick. Feverishly. Yes? Feverishly, I set to work. By the end of the first day, I had the beginning on canvas. I packed away my things. After a good night's sleep, I awoke invigorated and rushed back to my orchard to complete my picture. But on arrival, I was struck dumb with horror and amazement. Every tree was gaunt and bare. A spring storm had stripped my special orchard of its blossom. I was stricken. You must have been. I swore I would never paint again. Never! 
but slowly I am recovering my nerves. Sometime soon I will start. How long ago was this? Only two years. Michael is captivated by the island and promises to start work on an enormous canvas first thing in the morning. To capture the essence of Corfu. Unfortunately, he suffers from asthma and we do not know that Lugaretzia has placed on a chair in his room a blanket sometimes used for horse riding. In the middle of the night, we are drawn to his room by a noise like a troop of bloodhounds being strangled. <coughs> Poor Michael! Did I make him some tea? Brandy's what he needs. I'll open the windows. And I'll cover him with this blanket. <coughs> It's probably psychological, you know. He's trying to speak. I think you ought to sniff something. Uh, some of Jerry's ammonia, perhaps. It's wonderful if you're going to faint. Well, he's not going to faint. Although he probably would if he sniffed ammonia. Yes, dear, it is a bit strong. I wonder what could have brought it on. Are you allergic to anything in particular, Michael? Horses? No, no horses in here. Oh, man. I'll just tuck this blanket round him a bit more. <laughs> Another of my favourite visitors is Melanie, Countess de Toro. She's hardly been in the house for five minutes when, to my mother's consternation and my delight, she catches hold of her scarlet hair and removes it, revealing a head as bald as a mushroom top. Because she has a slight speech impediment, owing to her false teeth not fitting very well, her explanation is not very clear. Uh, I've just had a bout of erysipelas, lost all my hair. Couldn't find a wig and eyebrows to match in Milano. Suppose I might get something in Athens. Mother believes the Countess's recent disease to be of a more unladylike character than in fact it was. Disgusting. Larry, did you hear what she's had? And you call her a friend? A friend? Why, I hardly know her. Can't stand the woman, actually, but she's an interesting character and I wanted to study her at close hand. Well, I like that. So you invite the creature here and we'll catch some hideous disease just so that you can take notes. I'm sorry, Larry, you'll have to go. Don't be silly, Mother. You can't catch it. <laughs> Not unless you intend to share a bed with her. Larry, don't be revolting. Dr Andrew Helly later explains to Mother the true nature of the Countess's disease. It's not syphilis. It's erysipelas. It's a skin infection. Oh. Mother is conscience-stricken and extra affable to the Countess at dinner. Dear Countess, do please take your wig off if you're feeling the heat. Ah, grazie mille. Needing to escape at times from the crowds of Larry's visitors, I am thrilled to discover, in the crumbling wall surrounding the garden, some particularly dangerous inhabitants. What are these? They look as if they're made out of chocolate. Oh, they're scorpions! Now, Jerry, I absolutely forbid you to bring any scorpions into the house. Or any snakes. But, but definitely, definitely no, no scorpions. scorpions! However, one day I find a fat female in the wall, wearing what appears at first glance to be a pale fawn fur coat. Closer inspection reveals the garment to be made up of a tiny mass of babies. I'm going to smuggle you into the house in this earth. Matchbox. I'll keep you in my bedroom and then I can watch all your babies grow up. Jerry, Lance! Oh dear. Never mind. I'll just pop you on the mantelpiece in the drawing room so that your box gets plenty of fresh air. And I'll come back for you later on. Dawdling over the meal, feeding Roger surreptitiously under the table, I forget about my exciting new captures until Larry fetches his cigarettes and matches from the drawing room. Lying back in his chair, he puts a cigarette in his mouth and opens the matchbox. The female scorpion, her babies clinging to her desperately, scuttles onto the back of Larry's hand. <coughs> Logorexia drops a pile of plates. Roger begins to bark. Larry flicks the scorpion down the table, where she lands, thump on the cloth, midway between Margot and Leslie, her babies scattering like confetti. Enraged, she speeds towards Leslie, her sting quivering with emotion. Leslie leaps to his feet, overturning his chair, and flicks it with his napkin towards Margot. 
Mother, completely bewildered by the rapid change from peace to chaos, puts on her glasses to ascertain the cause, just as Margot hurls a glass of water at the scorpion, misses completely, and drowns Mother instead. <laughs> Kill the lot of us. Just look at that table, knee deep in scorpions. Wait, wait, don't do something! Stop screeching, Margot! Get a book for God's no, sake! Call us! Don't shut up, Roger! Have the scorpions get onto the table! No. That bloody boy, it's a wonder I wasn't bitten. Every matchbox in the house is a death trap. She doesn't mean any harm! Look out, it's coming towards me! Do something! Hit it with your knife! Your knife! Go on, hit it! No. Roger decides that the family is being attacked and that it is his duty to defend them. As the Goretti is the only other person in the room, he bites her on the ankle. This does not help matters much. Eventually, after impassioned pleas on my part, backed up by mother, Leslie's suggestion we should slaughter the whole lot of them. is quashed. While my family simmers in the drawing room, I round up the babies with a teaspoon, return them to their mother's back and the whole lot to the garden wall. As a result of this episode, I'm given a new tutor. Peter. And a large room on the first floor in which to house my beasts, which I call my study, and my family call... The, the Bad House. Here I stuff my first bat, which, considering how limited my knowledge of taxidermy is... What was it? I think looks extremely like a bat. A what? A bat. However, when summer comes, my bat starts to smell... And under pressure, I am forced to get rid of it. No! Whilst out trying to find a new bat, I managed to capture a baby owl called... Ulysses. My collection is coming along nicely, despite losing Achilles the tortoise, who falls down a well and, sadly, does not revive. Despite being given artificial respiration by Leslie. Summer brings my birthday. I work out special lists of what I want, one for each member of my family. All lists being based on applied psychology. Mother's list contains the most expensive things, for I know she will buy me them all. Five wooden cork lined cases with glass tops, two dozen test tubes, five pints of methylated spirits, five pints of formalin, and a full size microscope. Mm. Larry's list is a literary one. Hmm, good God, all books! Even if they are all on natural history. Margot's list takes account of the fact that she only goes into certain sorts of shops. Ten yards of butter muslin, ten yards of white calico, six large packets of pins, two bundles of cotton wool, two pints of ether, and a pair of forceps. You can get those from the chemist. Oh, of course, when I go to buy my acne cream. Leslie's list has only one thing on it. A boat? Yes. I can't afford to buy you a boat. I don't expect you to buy me one. I thought, if you know so much about boats, you'd be able to build me one. Oh, well, all right. But I'm not having you hanging around while I do it. Do you understand? You're to keep away until it's finished. Agreed? Agreed. On the day of my birthday, a peasant family present me with two new dogs. Puppies, one liver and white... With large ginger eyebrows. And one coal black. Also with large ginger eyebrows. Roger views these puppies with suspicion and interest. So in order that they should get properly acquainted, I lock them all into the dining room together, forgetting that some of my birthday lunch is already laid out in there. Unlocking the door later, it becomes clear that they have enjoyed quite a lot of it. And so Larry names them... Puke. And... Whittle for rather obvious reasons. In the afternoon, we all go down to the jetty to launch my new boat. Well, do you like her? Oh, yes. Oh. She's an interesting shape. Almost round. The planks were a little too short for the frame. She's got a lovely shape. Why, thank you. Hmm. A bit like a dung beetle's. Right. I uh, had to make her flat-bottomed for... Technical reasons. That means I can put jars of specimens on the floor without so much risk of them upsetting. That's what I thought. Do you like the colour scheme? Oh, it's the best thing about it. Uh, only I wasn't too sure about it. No, I love stripes. And I love orange and green. And black. And white. Good. 
<laughs> Does it have the faintest suspicion of a list to starboard? No. Oh, no. Perhaps not. Well, here's the mast, Jerry, but you shouldn't fit it into position until she's been officially launched. What are you going to call her? What about the Jolly Roger? No. I think it should be a fat sort of name. Mm. Arbuckle? No. It doesn't look like an Arbuckle. What about calling it the Ark? No. I know. Bootle. That's nice, dear. I was just about to suggest the bum trinket. It sounds rather rude, dear. The Bootle bum trinket. That's even better. All right, dear, but perhaps just the bootle when in conversation with strangers. Go on, then, for heaven's sake. Let's get on with the launching. Right. <laughs> I christen this boat the Bootle Bum Trinket. <laughs> right, now, let's get the mast in. Margot, mm -hmm. you hold a nose, and Peter, right. if you'll get into the stern, Larry and I will hand you the mast. All you have to do is stick it in that socket. Right. Mm -hmm. This mask looks a bit long to me, Leslie. Nonsense. It'll be fine when it's in. Now, are you ready, Peter? Yes. My new tutor nods, clasps the mask firmly in both hands and plunges it into the socket. Peter, clad in his only decent suit in honour of my birthday, disappears with scarcely a splash. All that remains on the surface is his hat, the mast, and the bootle bum trinket's bright orange bottle. He'll drown! He'll drown! Nonsense. It's not deep enough. I told you that mask was too long. It isn't too long. The fool didn't set it right. Don't you dare call him a fool. You can't fit a 20-foot mast onto a thing like a washtub and expect it to keep upright. If you're so clever, why didn't you make the boat? I wasn't asked to. Besides, you're supposed to be the expert, though I doubt they'd employ you on time side. He's coming up! <laughs> For the rest of the morning, Leslie, armed with a tape measure and a massive manual of yacht construction, saws bits off the mast until at last my boat floats upright. By then, the mast is only three feet high. My first voyage. Never has the sky seemed so blue and so transparent. Tiny offshore islands, so sun-drenched and enchanting. A hundred feet or so from the shore, I ship my oars and scramble up to the bows, where I lie side by side with Roger, peering over the edge, down through a fathom of crystal water to the sea bottom, where all the life of the sea congregates to greet me and my new boat. My boat gives me access to the life of the sea, but also to the further shores of the island. Sometimes, I beach my boat in a tiny islet and scramble up a hill to see what this new territory will yield to my curious eyes. In this way, lying flat on my back underneath five little cypress trees on the top of a hill, having unsuccessfully tried to dig a large green lizard out of its hole in a wall for an hour, I meet Yanni. Calispera! He's a shepherd. As his goats tear at the undergrowth, he leans on his olive wood stick and looks at me, his little black eyes fierce under his shaggy brows, his nose soaring like an eagle above his wonderful orange and white moustaches. Calispera! You are the foreigner, the little English lord? The islanders think that all English people are lords. Ne! Ime Englezos! Pos leyeste! Jerry! <laughs> well, little English lord, Jerry, I will tell you something. It is dangerous for you to lie here beneath these trees. Dangerous? Why? You may sit under them, yes. They cast a good shadow, cold as well water. But you must never be tempted to lie under them. Why not? Why not? <laughs> Why not? Because if you do, you will be changed when you wake up. While you sleep, their roots will grow into your brains and steal them. And when you wake up, you will be mad. Your head is empty as a whistle. Is it only cypress trees that can do it? Or is it any other kinds of trees? Only the black cypress is the thief of intelligence. So, prosohi, do not sleep beneath your trees, little lord. Though I know you are interested in the little ones of God. Mm. So, I am taking the goats now to Kasturi. But you will come soon to see me, yes? 
and uh, Isizi Gosmu, my wife. She's Aphrodite and eat my fix. And we'll talk some more. Oh, yes, please. Just ask for your knee, little English Lord Jerry. Huh? It is around this time that Larry's patronage towards Leslie, still smarting from Larry's remarks about my boat, rises to new heights. One day, Leslie returned from a trip to the mainland, puffed up with pride at having finally achieved... A left and a right. A what, dear? A left and a right. It means killing two birds in quick succession. First with your left barrel and then with your right. And I've done it. Leslie tells us about his left and a right all day, up to his waist in imaginary swamp, as Mother sits and plucks the felled ducks. And I did it. And they fell, like a stone, together, into the lake. Very good, dear. Must have been very difficult. Until Larry tires of hearing the story. I don't see why. Why what? Why it should have been difficult. Oh, don't you? And what do you know about it? You couldn't hit an olive tree at three paces. My dear fellow, I'm not belittling you. I just don't see why such a simple task should be so difficult. Simple? Well, it seems to me to be merely a matter of keeping a cool head and aiming straight. Don't be silly. You always think the things other people do are simple. Generally, they are, when I try them. It's the penalty of being versatile. When you try them? I've never seen you carry out one of your suggestions yet. A gross slander. I'm always ready to prove my ideas are right. You supply the gun and the victims, and I'll show you that a left and a right requires no ability whatsoever. Right. We'll go after Snipe down in the marsh tomorrow. Well, it'll give me no pleasure to slaughter birds that have every appearance of having been stunted from birth, but since my honour is at stake, I suppose they must be sacrificed. If you get one, you'll be lucky. Really, children, you do argue about the stupidest things. <laughs> Mother wipes the feathers off her glasses. Well, I agree with Leslie. Larry's too fond of telling people how to do things and doing nothing himself. It'll do him good to be taught a lesson. I think it was jolly clever of Leslie to kill two birds with one stone, or whatever it's called. Hmm. Early next morning, we all set off to see Larry perform his feat. It's damn cold, isn't it? Damn slippery underfoot. I don't see why Leslie can't just take my word for something without making us all go through this ridiculous farce to prove it. This gun's so damn heavy. There probably won't even be any game. I mean, the only thing likely to be out on a day like this is a mentally defective penguin. We reach the swamp. At the first bridge, three snipe purr up from under our feet. Larry flings the gun to his shoulder and pulls both triggers excitedly. Nothing happens. It might be an idea to load it. I thought you'd done that. You're acting as the blasted gun bearer after all. I'd have got that pair if it hadn't been for your inefficiency. Suddenly, two snipe rocket up out of the grass. Larry, balanced precariously on the swaying bridge, fires both barrels. <laughs> the gun <laughs> roars oh! and kicks. <laughs> and Larry falls backwards into a ditch. Hold the gun above your head. Hold it above your head. But Larry uses the gun barrels as a support to try and get to his feet. Look what oh, you're doing to the gun. Hurt. You're choking the bloody barrels. What the hell do you me to do? Lie here and be sucked under? I mean, here. Give me a hand, for heaven's sake. Get the gun out. I refuse to save the gun if you don't save me. If you give me the end of the gun, I can pull you out, you idiot. I can't reach you otherwise. Here, Here, then. Dear God, just look at it. Will you stop carrying on over that beastly weapon and get me out of here? (laughs) Do you want me to sink beneath the mud like a sort of sportsman Shelley? Yeah. We, We all heave repeatedly on the gun to no avail, except that when we stop, Larry seems to sink a little deeper. Oh, yeah. The idea is to rescue me. We're trying. Not deliver the coup de grace. Oh, stop yapping and try to heave yourself out. Oh, what do you think I've been doing, for heaven's sake? I've ruptured myself in three places as it is. At last, with a prolonged belt from the mud, Larry shoots to the surface, looking like a chocolate statue that has come into contact with a blast furnace. When he reaches home, convinced that it has all been a huge plot, he orders Ligorexia to build a large fire in his bedroom and retires to bed with a couple of bottles of brandy. By tea time, we can hear him singing lustily in his bedroom. Margot goes up to see if he's all right. We follow. He's trying to poison me. What's the matter with him? He's drunk. I'm trying to get him to take his up some salts, mm. but he keeps saying I'm trying to poison him. Poison. Look, come on, Larry, dear. Mm. Drink this down at once. Uh. The bedclothes heave and Larry's tousled head appears. 
You're a horrible old woman. What? I'm sure I've seen you somewhere before. <laughs> well, he must have had a lot. <coughs> anyway, he's asleep now, so let's just build up the fire and leave him. Early next morning, Margot, pale with emotion, comes flying downstairs to Mother's bedroom in her nightie. Wake up! Fire! Fire! In Larry's room! Mother struggles upstairs, trying, for some reason best known to herself, to get her corsets on over her nightie. Larry's on fire! Quick! Save him! <laughs> when we all run inside, Larry's sleeping peacefully in a room full of acrid smoke. <coughs> Larry! <coughs> Wake up, for heaven's sake! The room's on fire! What's the matter? The room's on fire. Well, ask Leslie to put it out. Margo, pour something on it. <laughs> Not brandy, you <laughs> fool. Water. Get some water. Here, Larry, let me have your bedclothes to smother the flames. Now, look here. What the hell's going on? Why are you tearing all my bedclothes off? I really don't see why I should freeze to death. Honestly, the fuss you all make, it's quite simple to put out a fire. Oh, shut up. Eventually, with Larry directing our endeavours, we managed to extinguish the fire. Larry lies back in bed with a sigh. Oh, well, thank goodness for that. If it hadn't been for me, you'd probably all have been burnt in your beds. Now, ah, could someone bring me a cup of tea, please? The strain of being woken up at dawn by a hysterical pack of people and having to take control of a crisis has given me the most splitting headache. <laughs> July brings a fat letter addressed to Mother, in large, firm, well-rounded handwriting, from our great aunt Hermione. She is not our most popular relative. She says the doctors don't hold out much hope for her. <laughs> they haven't held out much hope for her for the last 40 years. She says she always thought it a little peculiar of us rushing off to Greece, <laughs> but now that they've had such a bad winter, she... Oh, no. Hmm? Oh, Lord. What's the matter? She wants to come and stay. <gasps> no, oh. I refuse. I, I couldn't bear it. It's bad enough being shown Lugarecci's gums every morning without having great Aunt Hermione dying by inches all over the place. You'll have to tell her there's no room, Mother. But I can't, dear. I told her in my last letter what a big villa we had. See, she says here, as you now seem to be able to afford such an extensive establishment, I'm sure, Louis, dear, that you would not begrudge a small corner to an old woman who's not much longer to live. What can we do? Do. Write and tell her we've got an epidemic of smallpox raging out here. Uh, and send her a photograph of Margot's acne. Don't be silly, dear. I've already told her how healthy it is out here. Really, Mother, you are impossible. I was looking forward to a nice, quiet summer's work with just a few select friends and... and now we're going to be invaded by that evil old camel, smelling of mothballs and singing hymns in the lavatory. Really, dear, you do exaggerate. Why you have to bring lavatories into everything? And after all, she is a relation. What on earth's that got to do with it? Why should we have to fawn all over the old hag just because she's a relation, when the really sensible thing to do would be to burn her at the stake? She's not as bad as that. My dear mother, of all the foul relatives with which we are cluttered, she is definitely the worst. And that's saying something. I mean, look at Aunt Bertha with her flocks of imaginary cats <laughs> yes. and great-uncle Patrick... Wandering about nude and telling complete strangers how he kills whales with a penknife. <laughs> Why you have to keep in touch with them all, I don't know. Well, I have to answer her letters, don't I? Why? Just write, gone away, across them and send them back. I couldn't do that, dear. She'd recognise my handwriting. Can't one of us write and say you're ill? Yes, we could say the doctors have given up hope. You'll do nothing of the sort. Well, if we're going to be invaded by relations, there's only one thing to do. What's that? Move, of course. Move? Move where? To a smaller villa. Then you can write to all these zombies and tell them we haven't any room. But don't be stupid, Larry. We can't keep moving. We moved here in order to cope with your friends. Well, now we'll have to move away to cope with our relations. But we can't keep rushing to and fro about the island. People will think we've gone mad. They'll think we're even madder if that old harpy turns up. Honestly, Mother, I'd probably end up blowing a hole in her corsets with one of Leslie's guns. Larry! I do wish you wouldn't say things like that in front of Jerry. I'm just warning you. But it seems so, so eccentric to keep changing villas like this, dear. There's nothing eccentric about it. It's a perfectly logical thing to do. Of course it is. It's self-defence. Mm, I agree. And after all, a change is as good as a feast. Oh, I don't know. I'm not really sure about it. We'll see. Our 
Our new villa, perched on a hilltop among olive trees, is white as snow, standing, decrepit but immensely elegant, among the drunken olives, like an 18th century exquisite, reclining among a collection of char ladies. We like it as soon as Spyro shows it to us, and its charms are greatly enhanced, from my point of view, by the number of new creatures I find in its vicinity for my collection. Beneath a large, half-rotten olive trunk, I find two of the largest common toads I have ever seen, each one with a girth greater than the average saucer. They squat like two obese, leprous buddhas. In my hands, they feel like two flaccid, leathery balloons. When I find them, I feel I must share them immediately with someone or burst with suppressed joy. Mother and Spyro are in the larder when I rush in. Spyro's eyes bulge and his skin takes on a greenish hue, holding his handkerchief to his mouth. He waddles out onto the veranda and is violently sick. Oh, Jerry, you shouldn't show Spyro things like that. You know he's got a weak stomach. Why? What's wrong with them? Nothing, dear. They're lovely. She's lying, of course. It's just that not everyone likes them. Spyro comes back in. Call his master, Jerry. Why she shows me things like that? I am sorry I had to rush out, Mrs. Darius, but honest to God, when I see one of them bastards, I have to throw. And I thought it was better if I throw out theirs than in here's. Mm. But it is high up among the branches of an olive tree, in a large oval bundle of twigs, like a huge furry football, that I find two really controversial pets. The controversy begins the minute I show them to my family. Not more animals. What revolting things. Oh, they're sweet. Gollies, Master Jerry's. What's this? Baby magpies. I have to admit they are no beauties. Their bald heads and half-open, bleary eyes give them a drunken and imbecilic look. Their skin hangs in folds and wrinkles all over their bodies, pinned to their flesh by black feather stubs, and between their lanky legs droop huge, flaccid stomachs in which the internal organs are dimly visible. You'll have to watch out that they don't steal. Steal? I thought that was jackdaws. Magpies, too. Awful thieves, magpies. Larry waves a hundred drachma note above the baby magpies experimentally. Immediately, they shoot their heads skywards, necks wavering, mouths gaping. <laughs> You're right, by God. Look, they try to attack me and get the money. Don't be ridiculous, dear. They're only hungry. Nonsense, mother. It's obvious that even at this age, they've got criminal instincts. He can't possibly keep them. It'll be like living with Arsene Lupin. Don't be silly, dear. I don't see how they can do any harm if he keeps them in a cage and only lets them out for exercise. Exercise? You won't call it that when they're flapping around the house with hundred drachma notes in their filthy beaks. Are you going to keep them bastards, Master Jerry's? They're not bastards. They're magpies. Uh, what you call them? Magpies, Spyro. Magpies. Marking pies, eh? No, Spyro, magpies. That's what I says, marking pies. So the magpies they become. All goes well until they learn to fly and begin to map out the villa. One afternoon, Larry goes for a swim and, forgetting all about the magpies, leaves his window open. On his return, Larry utters a moan like a soul in torment. Oh! That brings us all running. In Larry's room, piles of papers lie scattered about the floor, all with an attractive pattern of holes punched in them. My manuscript! My life's work! The typewriter stands stolidly on the table, looking like a disembowelled horse in a bull ring, its ribbon coiling out of its interior, its keys bespattered with droppings. The carpet, bed and table are aglitter with a layer of paper clips, like frost. Larry's bicarbonate of soda has been scattered all over his books so that they look like a snow-covered mountain range. The entire room is decorated with an artistic and unusual chain of footprints in green and red ink. <gasps> oh, good oh. heavens, dear, what have you been doing? Mother, I am in no mood to answer imbecile questions. It must be the magpies. Anything missing? No, no. There's nothing missing. They've made an awful mess of your papers. What a masterly understatement, Margot. You're always ready, aren't you, with the apt platitude to sum up a catastrophe? How I envy you your singular ability to be inarticulate in the face of fate. There's no need to be rude, Larry. He didn't mean it, dear. He's naturally rather upset. Upset? 
rather upset. Yes, dear, I can see it's very annoying, but I'm sure the magpies didn't mean it. No, they're just interested in things. They can't help it. They're just made like that. All members of the Crow tribe are naturally curious. There you are, dear. I didn't ask for a lecture on the Crow tribe, thank you, and I'm not actually very interested in the moral sense of magpies, either inherited or acquired. It's disgusting the way this family carries on over animals. Why don't you all become magpie worshippers and erect a prison to pray in? The way you all carry on, you'd think that I was to blame and that it's my fault that my room looks as though it's been plundered by a tin of the Hun. Well, I'm telling you, if you don't either get rid of those birds or lock them up, I will personally tear them wing from wing. I build a large aviary for the magpies. The day it is completed, Mother brings home a new puppy of the Dandy Dimmant breed. Presented to her by a friend, Dodo looks like a long, fat, hair-covered balloon with minute bow legs. Good God! What's that? It looks like a sea slug. Mother, really? Where did you dig up that canine Frankenstein? Oh no, he's sweet. What's wrong with him? It's not a him. It's a her. She's called Dodo.、Oh. Well, that's two things wrong with it for a start. One, it's a ghastly name for an animal. And、two to introduce a bitch into the house with those other three lechers about is asking for trouble. <laughs> Apart from that, just look at it. Look at the shape of it. How did it get like that? Did it have an accident? Don't be silly, dear. It's the breed. They're meant to be like that. Nonsense, mother. Who'd want to deliberately produce a thing that shape? I think you're being very nasty about her, especially as you're in no position to talk about beauty. Before you throw stones, you should look for the beam in your eye. A proverb or a quotation from the Builder's Gazette. Let's not argue, dears. She's my dog, and I like her, so that's all that matters. Dodo has a weak hind leg, and her hip joint is liable to shoot out of its socket at any time, especially in the evening when we are all sitting quietly, absorbed in reading or writing or knitting. Being a stoic, she always greets this catastrophe with a series of piercing shrieks, so that by the time we have massaged her leg back into place. She has screamed herself into an exhausted sleep, but we are utterly unnerved. The other dogs treat Dodo with scorn, until they discover that she comes into season with monotonous regularity. When admirers arrive in such numbers, that mother has to go about armed with a stick. Get back! No! Put that away! Disgusting!、Uh, no! Go on! Get back! You're not coming in here. Eventually. Dodo falls victim to Puke's magnificent ginger eyebrows and gives birth. Whereupon she is so torn between her loyalty to my very mobile mother, whom she regards as her personal property, and her blob of an immobile puppy, that she nearly has a nervous breakdown. She resolves the problem by following mother around everywhere, with her baby hanging from her mouth by its head. If this goes on much longer, that puppy will grow into a giraffe. I know, poor little thing. But what can I do? Simplest thing would be to drown it. It's going to grow into the most horrifying animal anyway. Look at its parents. You certainly will not drown it. No, I shall just have to sit still in my room all day for the time being, and you'll have to bring up our meals on a tray. You can't allow yourself to be chained to a chair by a dog. It's my dog, and if I want to sit there, I shall. But for how long? This might go on for months. I think of something. In the end, Mother hires the maid's youngest daughter, Sophia, to carry Dodo's puppy around for her. So. Mother potters about the house like an Eastern potentate, with Dodo pattering at her heels and young Sophia bringing up the rear. Tongue protruding and eyes squinting with the effort, bearing in her arms a large cushion, on which reposes the puppy. Every evening, Mother goes for a walk with all the dogs. Roger, a senior dog, leading, followed by Puke and Riddle, followed by Mother in an enormous straw hat like an animated mushroom, followed by the waddling Dodo, followed by Sophia with the imperial puppy on its cushion. Mother's circus. Larry calls it. Oi, lady! What time does the big tap go up, eh, lady? He even buys some hair restorer so that mother can turn the terrified Sophia into a bearded lady. That's what your show needs, lady. A bit of class, see? Nothing like a bearded lady for bringing a bit of class to a show. August, the height of a Greek summer. I go down to the canal with the dogs, and spot. Two fat brown water snakes, coiled passionately together at the water's edge. I catch、oh. one. Got you.、Mm. Oh. But the other buries herself in the mud. I decide to feel for her with my feet and take my sandals off, 
feeling the liquid mud squeeze up between my toes till two great black clouds bloom about my thighs. Suddenly, I feel a slithering body and fling myself out of her, sinking beneath the dark waters which boil up into my ears and eyes and mouth till... I have him! I have him! A man is looking at me, squatting silent with the dogs. Yasu, your health. And yours. I put the second snake in my basket with the first. He watches me in silence till I am done. You are a stranger? I'm English, but I live here now, in a villa in the hills over there. What are you doing here? I am on my way down to the sea, to my boat. What about you? Now you have got your snakes. I'm going to the sea too, to wash. I have a basket full of cockles in my boat. You can have some if you like, if you want uh, to walk with me. Yes, thank you. Where are you from? From here, Apotovora, from the hills. My home is here, but now I am at Vido. Vido? But that's the prison island. That's right. I am a convict. Oh. Have you just been let out? No, worst luck. I have another two years to do. But I'm a good prisoner. Trustworthy. Any like me, the ones they feel they can trust are allowed to make boats and sail home for the weekend. Mm. If it's not too far. I've got to be back first thing. <laughs> ah. That is my boat. <gasps> What's that? In the boat, an immense black-backed gull with sneering yellow eyes. Tethered to the seat. I stretch out my hand. Don't touch him! The dark irises of the gull contract in surprise as I gently run my fingers down his back. But he does nothing. Ah, ye, Spirito. He must like you. He's never let anyone else touch him before without biting them. Where did you get him from? I sailed across to Albania in the spring. Found him in a nest. He was small then, fluffy as a lamb. Now he's like a great duck. A great, fat, ugly, biting duck. <laughs> Aren't you, eh? Could you... Could you get one for me? In the spring? You want one? You... You like them? I would sell my soul for a girl like that. Well, have him then. Don't you want him? Yes, I like him. But he's such a wicked one that he bites everybody. None of the other prisoners or the waters like him. I've tried to let him go, but he won't. He just comes back. I was going to take him back to Albania next weekend. So, if you want him, you can have him. It's like being offered an angel. As Costi and I eat our cockles, I never even stop to wonder how my family will react to a bird the size of a goose with a beak like a razor. He knows his name? Aleko. Mm. He'll come when you call. Aleko! Ah, ah, You'll need ah. some fish for him. In the morning, I'm going out in my boat at about eight. You can come with me if you like and catch a good lot to start you off. Thank you. And thank you for giving him to me. Ah! Mm, I have to go now. Mm, goodbye. Until tomorrow. Oh, by the way, why are you in prison? Oh, that. I killed my wife. Clasping my precious bird under my arm, I set off for home. Ah! Halfway there, Aleko suddenly decides that he has ah! no intention of being carried any further in such an undignified manner. His beak shoots out my hand. Ah! Ah! It's as if I've been slashed by an ice pick. I lose my temper, net Aleko with my butterfly net, tie my handkerchief around his beak with a bit of string and pinion his flailing wings to his body with my shirt. 
I only unwrap him when we get home. My God. Ah! What the ah! devil's that? And what an enormous bird. Ah! Is it an eagle? No, it's a whacking great gull. What nonsense, ah! Leslie. Ah! It's an albatross. No, it's a gull. Don't be silly. Who ever ah! saw a gull that size? Ah! I tell you, it's a bloody great albatross. Aleko pads a few paces towards Larry. Jerry, ah! get the damn thing under ah! control. It's attacking me. Just stand still. He won't hurt you. It's all very well for you to say that. You're behind me. Aleko snaps his beak a couple of times with a sound like a whip crack. Listen to it. Gnashing its teeth. They don't have teeth. Well, it's gnashing something. I hope you're not going to let the boy keep it, Mother. It's obviously a dangerous brute, and besides, it's unlucky. Why unlucky? Oh, it's a well-known thing. Even if you just have the feathers in the house, everyone goes down with the plague or something. That's peacocks, dear. No, it's albatrosses. And look what happened to the ancient mariner. We'll all have to sleep with crossbows under our pillows. Really, Larry, you do complicate things. Looks quite tame ah! to me. Uh, where are you going to keep it, Jerry? I thought I'd give him half the magpie's cage. Well, don't blame me if the house is hit by a cyclone. Why a cyclone, dear? Albatrosses always bring bad weather with them. It's the first time I've heard a cyclone described as bad weather. Where did you get him from, Jerry? A man I met down by the canal gave him to me. Nobody in their right senses would give anybody a present like that. What sort of a man? A convict. A, a convict? What do you mean, a convict? He's allowed home at weekends. I'm going fishing with him in the morning. I'm not sure if that's wise, dear. I mean... You don't know what he's done. It could be anything. Of course I know what he's done. He's killed his wife. <gasps> he's killed his wife? Well, what's he doing wandering around the countryside? Why haven't they hung him? They don't have the death penalty here, Mother. You get three years for murder and five years for dynamiting fish. <laughs> well, I've never heard anything so scandalous. Uh, I think it shows a nice sense of the importance of things. White bait before women. <gasps> ah! Ah! September. The anniversary of our coming to the island. And the family decides to give a party. For no other reason than that we suddenly feel like it. It's time this family had a party. Since it is September, we decide to call it... A Christmas party! Overflowing with the milk of human kindness, we invite everyone we can think of, even people we dislike. And so that the whole thing is not too straightforward, we invite our guests... To lunch. And tea. And dinner. The whole family throws itself into preparations with characteristic enthusiasm. Margot lies on the floor, covered in acne cream, drawing large, colourful murals in chalk on huge sheets of brown paper. Now these will look sweet. Mother steadily cooks her way through the carloads of food delivered to the door by Spyro. I got them fancy stuff only so use cut price, Mrs. Darrell. In a steamy kitchen atmosphere, redolent of the interior of a volcano. Do you think 200 soup lagia will be enough, Margot, dear? Leslie sits surrounded by mountains of rented furniture, also delivered in carloads by Spyro. Gollies, Mr. Leslie's. You must have enough of these occasion tables now. Mathematically working out, we have enough chairs for everyone to sit on. So, if there's 24 chairs in the dining room, and 12 chairs on the veranda, and 15 chairs under the trees... And Larry sleeps peacefully through it all. <coughs> Our parties never go as they are envisaged. There is always a last-minute hitch that switches the points and sends our carefully arranged plans careering off on a completely different track to the one anticipated. Our Christmas party is taken over by my animals. When the day of the party dawns, I discover to my horror that my beloved water snakes have eaten several of the new goldfish procured specially to make their pond look more rich and fascinating for the imminent guests. I have to move the snakes temporarily into a kerosene can whilst I clean and feed Aleko and the magpies. But then I discover with even greater horror that someone has moved them into the full glow of the sun. Mother! Mother! She's busy trying to simultaneously cook and beat off hordes of Dodo's followers. Dodo having inevitably come into season on this day of all days. Yes, dear? 
Show you mangy brute. Not yet. Mother, my snakes are nearly dead. Look, someone's put them in the sun. Oh, dear. But you really shouldn't bring them into the kitchen, Jerry, even if they are nearly dead. Can I put them in the bath? Please! They need some cool water. It's the only thing that will save them. I said, show you, horrible dog. <laughs> oh, no. Now Dodo's legs come out. Uh, all right, dear. <laughs> I put the snakes tenderly into the bath. They show immediate signs of reviving. So, relieved, I head out to the veranda to look at Mother's beautiful lunch table as the first guests arrive. Oh, no! The cutlery's been flung about haphazardly. Butter is spread all over the side plates and there are buttery footprints all over the cloth. Pepper and salt decorate the smeared remains of a bowl of chutney. The water jug has been tipped over everything. And a bottle of beer lies smashed on the flagged floor. <laughs> what are they that have done this, little lord? The magpies are drunk. One walks unsteadily across the table towards me with a flower in his beak, loses his balance at the edge of the cloth and falls heavily to the ground. Another clucks with amusement then puts his head under his wing and goes straight to sleep. Returning them to their cage, I notice... Oh, no. ...that a lecco is missing. More guests arrive. I search high and low for a lecco, but eventually conclude that he has flown to the sea for a quick swim. More guests arrive. Suddenly there is a roar. The sort of roar that the minor tour would produce if it had got the toothache, and Leslie runs into the party, naked but for a tiny towel. Where's that boy? No, no, dear, whatever's the matter? Snakes! Leslie tries to indicate extreme length with his hands and drops his towel. <gasps> Snakes! That's what's the matter. What are you talking about, dear? That bloody boy's filled the sodding bath full of bleating snakes. Language, dear, language. And do come put some clothes on. Damn great things like hose pipes. It's my fault, dear. I told him to put them there. The guests stare at Mother. Well, they were suffering from sunstroke, you see. Really, Mother? I think that's carrying things a bit too far. Oh, here we go. Why does Larry always have to interfere, Mother? Interfere? When Mother conspires with Jerry to fill the bath with snakes, I think it's my duty to complain. But oh, I... be quiet. What I want to know is, when's he going to move the bloody things? I think you're making a lot of fuss about nothing, Leslie. If it has become necessary to have to perform our ablutions in a nest of hammer dryads, I shall be forced to move. Oh, for heaven's sake, shut up. Only St. Francis of Assisi would really feel at home here. Larry addresses the mesmerised guests. I assure you, the whole house is a death trap. I've been attacked by a scorpion, a hideous beast that dripped venom and babies all over the place. My room has been torn asunder by magpies. Now we have snakes in the bath and huge flocks of albatrosses flapping around the house. Really, dear, you do exaggerate. My dear mother, if anything, I'm understating the case. What about the night when Quasimodo decided to sleep in my room? Well, that wasn't so dreadful, dear. Wasn't it? Well, it may give you pleasure to be woken at half past three in the morning by a pigeon who seems intent on pushing his rectum into your eye. Oh, but I, on the other hand... Everyone. Do please sit down and have some beer. Well, some wine. I'm sorry the table's a little dishevelled. Our magpies escaped, you see, but there's no real problem. I've just got to put some snakes into a saucepan. <laughs> or something. <laughs> and then we're going to have lunch. Do sit down. Sit, you bastards! <laughs> What is it? Is it scorpions again? Oh, no. Something bit me in my leg. Oh, under the table. What, what did I tell you? Probably find a wild bear under that tablecloth. Is that is a bear? Oh, oh, Lord, it's black and white. Oh, it's a lecco. It's that albatross. Oh, Keep still, everyone, unless you get your leg taken off at the knee. Oh, Dodo pursued by a pack of village dogs. It's Wallace! Meet him for a hard winter! Roger, Puke and Riddle now race in and hurl themselves jealously upon Dodo's pursuers. Keep calm! Everyone, keep calm! Everyone, keep calm! The dogs are savaging them! Oh. 
everyone with a soda siphon. Marvel, you fool! Put that soda siphon down! Pepper, try pepper on them! Save the ladies! Save the ladies! Water! Try water! Watch out! I'll fix us the bastards! The largest kerosene can I have ever seen. A mass of polished, glittering water curving through the air, hitting the floor and bursting up again to curve and break like a tidal wave over the room. A breathtaking scene of carnage, like a hen roost hit by a cyclone. Our friends soaked, feather encrusted, bereft of speech. All dogs gone. Thank you, Spyro. That was very effective. I knew then that our days were numbered. That, with that dinner party, the time had come, in Mother's view, for me to go somewhere to finish my education properly. But I like being ignorant. Everything is so much more surprising when you're ignorant. No, Jerry, it's time to go, dear. She was adamant. Within a few days, we had packed our bags and were standing on the quayside, trying to look upon our return to England as a holiday only, to believe that we should soon come back to Corfu. <laughs> Orders to God, I don't mean to cry, but it's just like saying goodbyes to my own people. I feel you belongs to me. The tender waited patiently while we comforted Spyro. Then we climbed aboard and it pulled away. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Corfu sank shimmering into the pearly heat haze on the horizon and then a black depression fell. Although my finches sang in their cages and the magpies clucked and Aleko yarped at intervals and the dogs snored, we barely spoke, any of us, until we got back to England. It was only then that Mother saw what the passport official at the Swiss frontier had written on our form. Look, what an impertinent man. Larry looked at the form. Well... That's the penalty you pay for leaving Corfu. What a thing to write. Really, some people are peculiar. We all looked at the fall. I, uh, I have it here now. It says... The, the Dorals. One, one travelling circus, circus with staff. In My Family and Other Animals... Younger Jerry was played by Adam Osden and older Jerry by Will Tacey. Mother was played by Celia Imry, Larry by Toby Jones, Margot by Anna Kirk and Leslie by Paul Hunter. Spyro was played by Andreas Marcos, John Quill by Katia David and Durant and Costi by Graham Hawley. All other parts were played by members of the cast. Original music was composed and performed by James Mackey. My Family and Other Animals was written by Gerald Dorrell, dramatised for radio by Janice Chambers, and was directed in Manchester by Polly Thomas. <laughs>